treat this is, this episode of Hold My Cutter. And we're here at Lee Com Park in Bradenton, Florida. And we're enjoying our special smoke. This episode is the Connecticut Torpedo Special Edition Oliva. And uh, a very smooth smoke and a good one. And our guest actually recommended this one. Mm -hmm. Our guest is the incomparable Jack Flash Wilson. Jack Wilson is in camp. He's helping with uh, some of the minor leaguers and big leaguers. Of course, one of the great shortstops in Pirates history. And what a story to tell. Jack, uh, first of all, you have been back here before for some fantasy camps yeah. at the ballpark. Yeah, it's amazing. But, but where we're sitting right now, you were just talking about how when you were first with the Pirates, we we're, we're kind of sitting right in the middle of a batting cage. We are. Right? I think this is cage two. Actually. <laughs> There's one here, one there, and then our very small, intimate clubhouse uh, just over here. I think it's, it's like a grayish, bluish building. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, those are good old days. It's uh, obviously changed a lot. What's it like to be back? That's a, honestly, it's, I mean, do you, it's do you, amazing. Do you it's, consider yourself, because you play with some other teams, but is there any doubt? I mean, you were drafted by the Cardinals. Right. Spent a lot of years with the Pirates. Uh, Silver Slugger, uh, 200 hits guy. We'll get into that. Then you're traded to Seattle. Spent, I think, your last years with the Atlanta Braves. But do you consider yourself a Pirate? Oh, 100%. You do? No, I, yeah. I, I appreciate it. I love the St. Louis organization just as much as I love Seattle and, and Atlanta. They're amazing people, amazing coaches, and awesome cities to play in. But nothing like here. This was home. This is what... This is where we are. We considered our family home. We grew, I grew up in Thousand Oaks, and that's where we went in the off season. But if you ask our kids like where they grew up, they'd say Pennsylvania, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So uh, we're we're black and gold through and through. We're a little green and gold now, uh -huh. just a smidge. <laughs> yeah, we could. We, it's a smidge. <laughs> Green's not as cool as black. We, just, we can just yeah. So because no. his son Jacob, a first round pick of the Oakland Athletics in 2023, and he's on the fast track. He's going to be a big leaguer. It is so wild, first of all, to even to see him, even wearing other, other than like a little league uniform, but to yes. see him now up there talking about being a first rounder, you and your wife Julie, and talking. It's just so surreal for those of us who've been around a long time. And it's a little different for Michael McHenry because for you two didn't. Your paths never crossed as players, oh. right? Mm -mm. How did you get to know Jack Flash? Fantasy camp. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's fantasy camp. Yeah, we we were. I mean, I was told you guys need to meet. And I think you've heard the same thing. Yeah. And then we just kind of hit it off as uh, friends. I looked up to him, kind of like a big brother, and kind of leaned on him in a lot of different ways, and it's just kind of grown from there. Yeah. Oh, it's been yeah. That's fantasy camp is an amazing time. It's something I really enjoy. Anytime you get to put on the the pirate uniform, really is special. And it, it was been special to me ever since I left here. You appreciate it more, you know, when your playing days are over. You know, putting that thing on, seeing. The number two or old school number 12, you know, like getting to put on the jersey again. So fantasy camp brings that back. And then obviously being here for spring training has been just a lot of emotions, a lot of emotions, yeah. a lot of. I stood at shortstop the other day uh, before before BP started. I just stood there, which is cool because when I look this way, it looks the same. Uh -huh. I just turn around. And oh, looks that's a great call. <laughs> you look toward home. Like, I look toward home. That's play. a great call. And I'm like, this is this is I mean. Braden looks the same, hours. but this is ball. Park. And honestly, too, we didn't have the we didn't have, we had a half field, but we didn't have the big field back here. Uh -huh. And so, a lot of our early work that we did when we when we had moved from Pirate City to here, you know, in the middle of spring training when things were games were get going, you did a lot of work early in the morning here and stuff. So I just spent hours and hours and hours every year standing in that one position, like looking in that direction. So you just just well, you know, there's a lot of emotions just standing there and just reflecting, and it's really cool. Let's take a trip down memory lane with Jack Wilson. Uh, you go to Oxnard <laughs> College, yeah. right? And you're drafted in 1998 by the St. Louis Cardinals. I, I think a ninth rounder. Yeah. All right. Uh, Oxnard College. I was unaware when you played that you know, we tried to be prepared for these games. <laughs> I, I I don't recall ever saying the same school th that. Uh, Terry Pendleton, yes. yep. Kevin Gross, mm -hmm. Tim Laker, who spent a little bit of time in the wow. Pirates organization, yep. the catcher. But tell us about Oxnard College and being drafted by the Cardinals. Yeah, I, it's it's kind of one of those things you look back and you're like, wow, this was all kind of like this storybook kind of way it was written. So the way that it all turned out, I can look out. I went to Oxnard College because and I, my parents were to fight me. Do your homework. Do your homework. <laughs> Get good grades. 
And because I didn't, I had to go to junior college. So, <laughs> and I <laughs> told them, you kids right. out oh, there. Oh my like, gosh, you didn't listen to your parents. I was the guy that was, uh, I would just find out I need a 2.0. All right, I'll get a 2.0. <laughs> exactly. And just on that you're, line. You're right on my level. I told a, te- a teacher once, was, we, were going, to base- like Jack we were going to baseball season, and the teacher oh knew I was, a, I was a baseball player. And uh. she saw, she came up and showed me my grade, which I wouldn't say what it was, but it, it rhymes with F. And <laughs> she goes, do you, do you need me to make this a D so you can play? And I'm like, that'd be nice. And I'm doing all the calculations. I'm going to carry the two. No, that's 2.0 with an F. No, we're good. You can keep it. I've no, earned that. I did. I took it. Oh, I took my it. gosh. She, I just, my, looked I my, she just looked at me because back in the day, that's like your baseball class started at, was a class. So you automatically got an A for being on a, on an athletic team. It was your PE grade. So oh. that, that got me to my 2.0 every year. But yeah, don't do that. Do your homework. Go to school. It's you you dropped the PE grade, we'll by the way. We'll, we'll get back to that. <laughs> yeah. but, I'm sure you got 100 in there. But, oh, um, man, that's good. Moore Park College was actually really close. It's about 15 minutes from where I lived in Thousand Oaks. Wait, what's it called? Moore Park College. Oh, it Moore was a junior Park. college. Oh, okay. And, but the Oxnard College coach had a – he had his – a way of getting his players to the next level, whether it was pro ball or going to a a four-year school. And he would just, my brother had gone to Oxnard, but he would come and he would come to the house, knock on the door. And we were, well, Oxnard College was 45 minutes away, but he pursued me and pursued me. And and Moore Park was a a pretty good program, but it was just like, they expected just to get the local guys because that's just, who's going to drive to Oxnard every day to go to school and, and just to play baseball. But because this coach Pat Woods because he did that that got me bought in because I wanted to go to the next level and play baseball after two years of junior college so that's what that's what made me make that decision to go there for the two years and it was the best decision I ever made I mean obviously it was a forced decision in a sense with the GPA but uh, <laughs> but that was the best decision I made to, to take those trips every day it was worth it by the way what did your folks do for a living so both were they my from parents, California from Cal- uh, they were both originally from Texas uh, they oh, both mo- they both <laughs> were originally from Texas both moved to Thousand Oaks and met in high school oh my god and so um, wow. yeah so we were our whole lives were in Thousand Oaks my parents went to Thousand Oaks High School my uncles went to Thousand Oaks High School I went me and my brother went through Thousand Oaks High School Jacob would end up going through Thousand Oaks High School so uh, but yeah they were postal workers my dad worked at the window um, so he was the guy that you went to to go mail stuff off and then my mom was a sorter in the back so Son it's, of a gun. yeah, and, and they were one part. You coached at Thousand Oaks. I did coach school. at Thousand Oaks. Yeah, so yeah, so holy full circle, full circle, man. Love that place. That's that's where kind of everything. Or I played football, soccer, and baseball there. And I watched my brother go through there before me, a couple of years before me, and we just we love that school and we love everything that they're about, and and we still follow them to. The, I still follow them on Instagram and follow their high school team playing baseball. So. Yeah, we love the, Sparky uh, Anderson, right? Sparky Anderson from Thousand Oaks, for the, sure. The, yeah, the late there. Hall of Fame yeah. manager, oh. the Reds and Tigers. Oh. He's also yeah. a Thousand Oaks guy. Amazing. Can Amazing. I nerd out a minute? Yeah, we got On baseball stuff? Sure. Soccer. Yeah. You're you're all about feet. We're going to go baseball a bit. Gonna no, have- no, I, I, I was just going to ask that. because Yeah. I remember when Jack came to the Pirates, I had not heard much about that, but he kept impressing mm-hmm. on us because we asked him, why are you so good with your glove? Well, it's his feet. And it's soccer was a yeah. big deal. Yeah, yeah, go into that a little bit because I, I'm a huge believer with catchers in yeah. soccer. I played soccer a little bit growing up and getting to know him more with my brother because he's a certified national youth coach. Right. He's really opened up my brain to like how much it could help guys understand their feet, the movements, everything else, because you're right. controlling everything with it. So Absolutely. go into that a little bit because I've seen your feet. They're still good at <sighs> 41 years old. Yes. Jeez. 46. He still gives it. He's giving me five years, which is great. Uh, do that to me. He'll give me 10. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's over there at uh, 45. <laughs> so when I was growing so my, my main sport, my whole childhood, all the way through high school was soccer. Baseball was second by far because it was the soccer we could play year round. Baseball wasn't year round at the time. Huh. And that was my passion. That was my love. My goal was to one day play professional soccer from the so time. Cool. I loved it. My brother was the baseball player. I was a soccer player. When, when we would go out to the park, uh, on the weekends with my dad, I, he would bring the Jake. Yeah, uh, my my brother Andy would bring the baseball stuff. I would bring the soccer stuff. Wow. So I'd be like, all right, I hit a little bit, but when are we gonna take shots? 
like I was a goal scorer. So I wanted, I wanted to take shots. I was on a, an incredibly nationally ranked uh, high school team called the Las Virgis Falcons. Uh, we went to every major national tournament. Like we were, it, we had like real deal. Yeah, we had like fifteen or sixteen guys. I think nine or ten of them ended up playing professionally, and that was like from age like 12, 13, 14. Because before that, you just play AYSO and and, and all stars and stuff like that. But that was my passion. That was what I wanted to do. And then as time went on, like understanding there was no MLS. Uh, and so you had to be good enough to play internationally. And, and over time that showed that that probably was a good chance that that wasn't going to happen. Right. And then right about my junior or senior high school is kind of where I'm like, well, I think baseball is going to be my best chance to continue to try to be a professional athlete. So then we went kind of all baseball at that point. But soccer was – and I'm, both my girls are soccer players now, so it's like the best thing ever because I get to go watch them play uh -huh. the game that I love. And and I love baseball, but like my whole childhood was surrounded of going to play soccer tournaments. That's interesting. Like that. that means that you were – Grew up, grew up not a baseball fan, even of the, the yeah, there was, no. you had no baseball hero. No, I right? watched I watched World Cup national teams. I went to wow. World Cup games. I when it came to LA, I think it was in '94 we had the the World Cup in LA. Um, yeah, that was really didn't pay much attention to baseball. Kurt Stillwell, uh, who you probably yeah. remember, he went to Thousand Oaks High School, so he oh, was our nice. local hero. Oh, wow. So I followed him in a sense, but not really the game, or I didn't really get serious into it. I was good at it, so. When I was off from soccer and I was playing little league, like I was, I was good at it, but it didn't feel the same. Like to me, scoring a goal was like, like hitting a grand slam. Oh, wow. It was so cool. I mean, to this day, I, people ask me like, "What's your favorite memory about the, you know playing playing sports?" And they were talking. They think they're gonna get a baseball answer, like going to the All Star game. Like I was like, actually, I was twelve. <laughs> we, were, we were playing. Uh, I was thirteen. We were playing the USA Cup, which was a huge travel soccer tournament for all club teams from all over the world and it was in minnesota and uh in soccer you have group a group b group c just like the world cup but there's always one group they call the group of death which means there's four teams in the group and three of them are really really good so some team that's supposed wow. to move on won't move on they huh. call it the group of death it happens every year in the world wow. cup so we get placed in the group of death there's something like two or three hundred teams we get the number one ranked team the national team from Russia. Wow. Number one ranked team in the world. Hadn't lost a game in two years. We get them game two. And we beat them two to nothing. And to this day, I've never been able to replicate the feeling I had when we scored our first goal and then we banged a second goal. And all we did is we said, you know what? They were all six foot, six foot one, speaking Russian. And back in the day, we're like all watching those 80s Russian movies with like Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is like stuff. a miracle it's on like Dude, Ford. it was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, it's like Rocky Ford. They all look like Drago. Every one of them. And we couldn't understand a word they said. It was super intimidating, but we're like, you know what? Every time we get, they get the ball, we're going to slide tackle and put them on the ground. Beautiful. And we just out muscled them and we beat them to nothing. And it out muscled the, the muscle. It was wow. the most unbelievable feeling I ever had. I still wow. get goosebumps. Now, what, what about contributions to those two goals that you have? I didn't actually. I didn't. We had two. We had a superstar stud that, that play, ended up playing over in England, Chris Sawicki. And he put two. We put uh, put away a header with uh, uh, on a header on a corner kick. And then he he we had a, like a scuffle in the middle of the ball kicked down. And he banged one home just under the bar. Um, but it was but like, yeah, we were. We were so pumped. I never had that much energy before. Like we were just hitting them so hard. Like we were like, you know what? We're not going to be intimidated. We're just going to go ball out. And it was That's it was amazing. such a great game. It That's was unbelievable. Un that, what's unbelievable is like your greatest moment yeah. in your life in sports Dude. is as a thirteen year old. Yeah. Yeah. So us who play little league can, <laughs> yes. can, can yes. certainly appreciate what you're talking yeah. about. I mean, but it's just like like you said, it's like the miracle on ice. You're like you're you're not supposed to win this yeah. game, and you oh just got, just had a bunch of guys that believed in ourselves. And to this day, we still have a text thread. Our team. No. To this yeah. day, come on. We still have a text thread, but that team. How many guys? That's a culture uh, you want to build. I think the there's. Text thread, you think? I think there's about. There's about 15 or 16. That's so Because that team went up to high school and we stopped at high school. Then most of the team went to Westlake High School. And I was the only one from the team that went to the rival T.O. High School because I had to play. Then I had to play against oh. them, which was like great. And we never beat them, but I always scored on our goalkeeper, which oh. yeah, I, I never let him down. I never <laughs> let him remember, like forget that every time I played against our goalkeeper on that team, I was able to punch one away on him. So I was pretty pumped. But, well, we're going to have to yeah. do that. I played goalie when I, when I played. Oh, I love it. And in Tennessee – the seasons overlapped, or I think I really would have done it because all my really close friends played. Yeah. When I was there, they ended up being number one in the country, which was yeah. really cool for me to watch them. And some of them went over, some of them played MLS. It was mm -hmm. neat to see. And everything you're saying is like, man, I can imagine 
Because I remember the first time I saved a goal. Yeah, right. In a rival game. And I'm yeah. 13. Right, right. Funny exactly. enough. And it, it was so cool. It came up and like tackled me. Yeah. It was a big deal. Yeah, it's oh huge. And it was like, whoa, that's my first real experience. The first time I did it, they scored seven goals. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we're playing, dang it. Yeah, we're playing a you 14 or 15, goalie. like I guess you team <laughs> that, you know, they just absolutely annihilated me. I'm just covered in dirt. Yeah. Diving. <laughs> so yeah, it is a tense sport. It's yeah. a lot of fun and that's really, really cool. Yeah, wow. so that's an idea for a pregame for you Absolutely. This year. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's do it. You're in goal and Jack's going to try and score. Yeah, he'll definitely you. score on me, but I'll try goal. my best. Yeah. I, oh got, my I got really lucky. It came for, so soccer is huge in the Pacific Northwest. It's the number one sport out there so when i played in in seattle the seattle sounders of the mls is a big deal i mean they sell out like they get they they set attendance records every year and i actually got to go train with some of the players Come on the on. team My yeah gosh. at the end of the at the end of the year i think in the end of 2010 i got the season was ending and i got to go out and they were they were still in season so i got to go to their practice facility Amazing. they gave me the full kit the whole nine yards i brought my own soccer Boots is what they call it. And I got to go take shots on Casey Keller, who was a four-time USA national team goalie. It was the best How'd thing you do? ever. How'd you do? I did all right. I did all right. I got I got some compliments from the coaches because like I was I was banging some home, which was cool. I think Casey was letting a couple go in to make me feel good, but just the experience of being out there with professional soccer players. That was my, that was my dream. So I got to experience my, I got to go two practices. So that was like a huge deal for me. It's so That's wild. Yeah. I guess the Pittsburgh river hounds maybe weren't. No, I don't think, I don't ever remember. They I don't weren't there yet. They, they weren't they, there yet. Or I, I, I never, I would have gotten, I would yeah, love to go there. there. I would yeah, have loved it. Yeah. I would we'll love get you to Pittsburgh that. and get that done. Let's go. Yeah. 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 Well, but we got to get to the story about Jacob. As it might as well go ahead and do that right now. We'll bounce yeah. all over the Jacob's place. Jacob's a good soccer That's player. That's what we do. Yeah. yeah. Hold hey, my daughter. Your, 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 your son, <laughs> who's now part of the Oakland Athletics organization, first round pick in 2023. He's about 11 years old. This is going into the 2014 baseball season. It's when we have a pregame opening day ceremony. We bring in former gold glovers, I guess, and, and all stars, yeah. and, and we do a ceremony. And you're in, so tell us about Yeah, so I, they called me to, to give, I guess I was the last Silver Slugger award, award winner. So that's what it was. Kutch wins the Silver Slugger, Pedro wins the Silver Slugger. Bonds has come back for the first time to give the MVP to Kutch in. Okay. Um, so we, we go out there and we find out there's uh, a Penguins game the night before, and it's absolutely Jacob's 11th, or 11th, I think it's 11th birthday. And we, I had taken Jacob over there when I was playing to go over to the Mellon Arena back when it was the Mellon Arena and, and watch some skate stuff like that. So we, we kind of had like he met Mark Andre Fleury back in the day and, and Sid when he was just starting. And um, so we go to the night game the day before the ceremony, the opening day, and the owner puts us in the suite. It was awesome. He says, "Hey, if we win, we can go down and see the guys." End up taking home taking home the victory. Went down and Sydney kind of just. Like came over, you know, he's he loves baseball too. He's a he's a baseball fan. I got, you know, met him again and, and he remembered a little bit that he met Jake back in the day when he was a little little guy. And he's like, You mind if I take him around? I'm like, well, Sid, so Sydney, do whatever you want. You. Yes, Sydney, please. Check him in the boards yeah. if you want. I got no problem. <laughs> Throw a couple pucks at him in the goal. Yeah. So he oh, takes him man. like twenty minutes and meanwhile I'm meeting all the other guys and I'm like, dude, my kid's gone. And he comes back, he's got a signed Crosby jersey and a signed stick and it was a special moment, you know, for for me, but but for him too. I mean, Jacobs, you know, he's grown up in clubhouses, so he's he knows a lot of players, and I've introduced him to a lot of guys. But like, there was something special about Sidney Crosby, you know, and, and that was the word behind him. And at that time, he had already he's he's become one of the best players in the NHL, and that happened pretty quickly. So then, the cool thing, fast forward, you know, Jacob gets drafted, and he goes off and he plays a ball uh, in Lansing, Michigan. And he wants, he's has, now he has this off season he's never had before. And we're trying to help him navigate what an off season looks like. It's so different because there is no off season in college baseball. You play pretty much year round. It's season, summer ball, fall season. I mean, it's nonstop. So he's like, what do I do with myself? So I'm like, hey, we just do some, do some trips, we'll meet up with your friends, whatever, enjoy stuff. So we, we come up with this idea, the last trip before spring training, we find out the Penguins are playing in Vegas. So I'm like, hey, Let's get some guys together. Let's go to Vegas, hang out for the weekend, but go see, go see, you know, go see the Penguins play. So we get hooked up, and I'm like, ah, you know, Danny Kroll used to be clubhouse kid here. He, he's now one of the main cl- um, equipment guys for the Penguins. So I reach out to him. I'm like, hey, you know, what do you think about like, like we're gonna come in? Like, can we come to like morning skate? He's like, let me check. So we get clear. We're going to morning skate. So I'm like, oh, dude, I'm like, we're gonna see Sid again. It's been a while. Then I had this idea. I'm like, wouldn't it be cool? if 
Jacob were to give Sidney Crosby an autographed jersey of his. So I had an Oakland A's number one incredible. Wilson jersey made up. He signed it to Sid. Oh. So thanks for the incredible memories. You made a huge impact on me and best of luck, whatever, signed it. And then so we met up with Sid after morning skate and gave him the jersey, kind of like so a full cool. circle. We yeah. wanted him to know, because I'm sure every, I mean, you get to an athlete and he's making such an impact on this, on his game and on the city of Pittsburgh. And then this was an opportunity for us to show our appreciation to what, to the time he took for Jacob when he was a little guy and the special, that stuff was plastered all over his room. The sticks, the, the jersey, the whole nine yards. So it made a huge impact on him. And so we wanted to say, Thank you. So we were able to meet up with him and and get him the uh, a Jacob Wilson jersey, and and he actually was really cool about it. He like generally looked like he, he was like excited it. to get it. And I'm like, I don't know if he's gonna wear it or not. <laughs> he remembered Jacob, which was great, and I think Danny Cole reminded him about you know that that stuff. Had, but yeah. he remembered he remembered him from back in the day. So it was a really cool moment to 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 have that exchange. Well, I, I have heard That's that awesome. from other people who know Sidney awesome. Crosby. They say it all the time that, that there's just nobody like it. He's, yeah. he's just incredible for, for being you know, one of the greatest hockey players ever. Right. Uh, he just d doesn't miss any. He gets it. And that's what I remembered about Jack Wilson and why I'm friends with Michael McHenry for the same reason, because you guys played at the highest level of baseball, Major League Baseball, never forgot where you came from. You never forget what's important, and that's people. Mm -hmm. And I remember, Jack, I think, I want to say we're in Indiana, PA, but I remember being at a table at a restaurant after another autograph session at the care of the winter the caravan, caravan. And, you know, yeah. eight inches caravan. of snow. Yes. And we're, yeah, back, back in the day, Mike, back we had day. players yes. come in. Oh, I, I get to do a couple of them oh, you know, okay. before, before right. they stop. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so, yeah, but I remember toasting Jack, because we call him Caravan Jack, because <laughs> it didn't really matter. Like it. it didn't matter again what happens, and I'm not blaming these guys. It just does. It, life gets busy, but what happens is we come up as a, a rookie, young player. Yeah, I'll do it. You come in, you're excited to do it, and you get paid a little stipend, whatever it might be. And a year or two goes by, and maybe that player is elevated and gets bigger, get becomes a big leaguer, in air quotes. And then you, you want to come back to Pittsburgh? Now nah, I'm, I'm good where I am. Uh, but Jack always came back, and anytime we asked him to do anything, and that's why I asked you about your parents. Yeah, it, it must come from your parents. Absolutely, and you pass that down to Jacob. Absolutely, it's, right? I mean, it's you know, it's a responsibility. You hey, know, I think it's a responsibility, and some people look at it in different ways. And I don't blame people for looking at it a, cer or a certain way. When you know, like Charles Barkley comes back, we're not role models, and that's that's okay to have that theory too. I'm not saying that's wrong. I just felt like I felt like you know they, these people come out and they support you they spend their hard-earned money to come out and they support you and there's no better feeling on this planet than looking out there and having somebody wearing your number in your jersey i mean there's still like it's it's they've invested in how much they enjoy watching you play and i always and my parents are the same like i felt like when i was affected by players that i would meet at a young age kurt still made a huge impact on me because he made time for me when he would come back to thousand oaks and I would see him take ground balls getting ready and I and he would talk to me. And I just remembered how that felt. Like I felt so special that a big leaguer, who's one of the best in the game, he was an all-star from our hometown, would give me the time of day and would just want to talk baseball or like go through baseball cards together. And, and to this day, I have a relationship with him. He works for Scott Boris and I see him oh all God. the time. He scouted Jacob, like like the whole night. I still see him to this day. I give him a huge hug and, and he had a huge impact on, on me. And I was like, well, if, if I ever got to that point, I remember what I felt like, what he made me feel like by him taking time out for me. And I said, you know, if I ever got to that point, I would want to replicate that as much as I could to, to give back and to, to give people a chance to talk or say yeah. hi or answer a question or something like that or sign an autograph. I always felt like that that was instilled in me from my parents and from really Kurt Stillwell and how he, how he handled me when I was just a little kid just wanting to learn from a professional shortstop it's funny because we you know you have you have a moment i'm sure oh it, absolutely right? i mean I, I think about you know time michael jordan it was my idol i was throwing out a pitch and i don't remember a lot of a lot of the moments but i remember my mom got me an opportunity with her work to throw the first pitch because she couldn't throw and so i go out there and he signed it and i didn't even understand how big the moment was i didn't really think about it but looking back and reflecting it's like here this guy is he walked over to me they didn't ask him to and it was a moment, it's probably a, a kind of a God moment mm. that said, 
I want to play in the NBA now. Obviously, I'm high challenged. <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. But at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, it just re- whether he did that throughout his career or not, that moment said to me is like, I'm a nobody. This happened, and I want to make sure I always give back. And then I think both of us have a strong faith to say like, it's kind of our obligation. This game's given us so much. Yeah. You've said that to me time and time again. Why would we not want to give it back? Where was it, it, by the way? Where was this Michael Jordan meeting? It was, it was in Knoxville, Tennessee, at a Smokies game. Yeah, my mom's work. Was this when he was playing baseball? Yes, yeah, when he was playing yeah. baseball. Uh, yeah, so, so he was the, the visiting stuff. team. His visiting team. And he came out. He yeah. came over, saw wow. this little kid that was like probably a wild Tasmanian. Yeah. And gave, <laughs> you know, gave him a handshake. Wow. I didn't even ask for autograph. Like, I, 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 I was like panicked. And then somebody grabbed something and said, ask for an autograph. And signed a piece of paper. I still today don't know where it is. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because yeah, nice I was a kid, I put it in my yeah, pocket and probably nice got washed path. up. Yeah. So yeah. getting some power washing done yeah. here, by the way. But um, I was so enthralled in the moment, like you said. Yeah. And then there's different guys throughout my career. I'm back in Middle Tennessee. I'm spending time at night listening to these guys that are in the minor leagues chasing their dream. And they're just giving me the time of day and I'm putting the ball on the tee. Yeah. Well, I just I just I'll never understand how any human doesn't remember that I don't understand them forgetting it mm. I don't understand players passing up kids now, they, they don't do it a lot but right. I see it you know and I'm, I'm not, nobody specifically but and it's different I know it's way different in this day and age but just having watched it the guys that do it and do it right mm. you two are great examples of that you get you get drafted out of Oxnard College by the Cardinals so I imagine you become a you know you've invested in the Cardinals mm. do you think if you're when you start playing pro ball, Jack, and eventually you're going to be. And who was the was the uh, shortstop with the Cardinals then? So they had Edgar Renneria, Fernando oh. Vino in the middle. Yeah, he was oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, he was, yeah. Yeah. That was okay combo. Yeah, when, actually, when I got drafted, they had those two guys, and they had five shortstops in the top 100 prospect list. Oh, thank no. you. And I'm like, I call my agent. I'm like, is this a problem? <laughs> <laughs> and, he's, and he's like, he's like, no. St. Louis likes veterans. They trade all those guys anyway. Oh. So he's like, you're going to get traded anyway. Come so on. just play. Oh, 100 percent. Really? Yeah, because I mean, Renneria just signed a four-year deal wow. World Series winner amazing player Fernando Vina was a phenomenal second baseman great leadoff hitter I had a plane against those two guys yeah. after I got traded but he's like no, he's like you understand this game the odds of you making a debut with the team that drafted you are just low and he said Tony La Russa loves veterans so you How that funny move. you say yeah. that when I got drafted I was told it's very rare for you to make it. It's usually the second or third team is where you stick with. Yeah. And I don't think that's talked about enough. Everybody gets so locked in on where they're at in the moment, which is good to a certain extent, but we don't think like, hey, there's other teams out there. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good said you're going to be, you're playing for th- there are 29 other teams every time you step on the field. I'm like, really? Oh, well, I didn't know better. I'm like, well, yeah, okay. Sounds good. So two years later. Honestly, too, it was crazy because like. Two years. It's crazy. It was two years later. Yeah, that's nuts. So yeah. What are you, 23? It's 23 when I broke. Yeah, I turned 22 in the December, and then I made the team here. Uh, I had that. I came over to Altoona halfway through Double A. I got traded over to Altoona. I had played for Lloyd in the California Fall League. Lloyd McClendon. Lloyd McClendon was in the Cal League. That one year they had that California League, which is basically the Arizona Fall League for A ball players. Okay. Uh, so that's how we met. And we had a nice relationship and he believed in me as a player so much that he kind of orchestrated the trade uh, from Jason Christensen to, to get to the Cardinals because they left-handed, needed a left-handed, left-handed reliever. pitcher Jason Christensen yeah. a reliever goes to the Cardinals in uh, July 29th 2000 yeah and then and, and do you remember when you were told you're being traded and what your reaction was uh, we had an off day we had an off day so Julie and I was just hanging out we were just hanging out at the apartment uh, and uh I got a I got a call from the manager from the double A manager at the time that I was playing for in Arkansas saying that like I traded and then like as I and then I flipped to like Sports Center and my name came on the ticker. Uh, I'm like, oh dude, I'm on the ticker. This is real. <laughs> like, this, this is real. The, I got a Jay now. Dot Wilson. I'm like, let's go. <laughs> I've been traded. And it said double A and then there was all these like oh like he's a Mark Loretta ish type player. I'm like, dude, I'll take it. Like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I didn't even know you did comps on this. So I'm like, who saw me play to say that I was that's a Mark great. Loretta guy? So it was kinda overwhelming and then you're like, next thing you know, you're Packing up your stuff, jumping on a flight, going to a, a place called Altoona in Pennsylvania. I've never knew nothing about. Knew it. nothing about. I'm like, okay. Um, and I started. I, I remember buying a Baseball America just so I can look up the Double A Altoona stats to get the names of the guys that I was going to be playing with, and kind of just had to buy a magazine. I had to buy a magazine because I'm like, I was right there. I'm like, oh, dude, let me go see who some of my teammates are. 
and started and then just looked at the box, like just looked at their stats and be like, oh, Adam okay, Heizdu can't any, get any, out. Okay, I was just gonna say Adam oh, Heizdu. Well, because H H Y Z D U, and you're like, has uh, has a dude? <laughs> his dude. He was hitting like three fifty. I'm like, this guy's good. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was Rico Washington. Uh, there was Rob Makoviak, and there was another Makovi Makoviak. I'm like, so I was trying to get a little yeah. bit of like a little bit of stuff. So when I showed up, I wasn't. But I had to meet everybody for the first time. We were playing in Portland. I had to meet the team there. And I, I think I went 0 for 5 and like struck out like three times. I'm like, yeah, nice trade. <laughs> Good job, guys. They put me in the three hole, too. I'm like, wow. dude, yeah. no pressure. Welcome, sir. Wow. Yeah. No pressure. But, you know, yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, it was, it was kind of, it was a whirlwind, but it was, you know, it was amazing that I went, I went the next year and that off season. Funny story. We, I get invited to Pirate Fest, right? As a minor leaguer, so I'm on their like prospect list or whatever, which I didn't really know much about. And I'm, I'm with JR House oh in like the basement where they put the minor leaguers to sign autographs wow. over at the Science <laughs> Center. The I'm at the very bottom, and JR oh. House is like Mr. Football, like number yes. one prospect, West Virginia guy, yeah, catcher. Yeah. And I'm oh, like, great. yeah, I'm, he's got cards. I don't even have a card. I'm like, dude, <laughs> oh my, I'm God. just signing random stuff. I'm here, Jack Wilson. Oh, yes. This but way, the, sir. Yeah. The best part about it is I had never, other than being in Florida, I'd never really been on the East Coast so much at that time in the year. So I played in Potomac, Virginia with St. Louis. Okay. So I was in Peoria, Illinois, but never in, I think it was January we had Pirate Fest yeah, or yeah, something. So, ju- so, so I it was warm and sunny. So I, yeah. I literally showed up for Pirate Fest. I was on the flight in a t-shirt and shorts <laughs> coming from Southern California. And I got off Didn't that plane and I'm like... Oh my gosh! And I had nothing. Back. You didn't think about it either. Julie came with me because I'm like, we got to do this together, and we were both in SoCal stuff, not even thinking about oh, like, my god. And I'm like, snowball oh, fight. Hey, this is different. We yeah. need to go to that store yeah. and buy some sweats. And yeah. like, I need to go buy jeans and like a nice shirt. I'm like, it was crazy. But that was my first like time in Pittsburgh. Was at Pirate Fest. I'm like, man. This is different. It's really cold. <laughs> but I remember that was my first taste of like being with pirate fans and in a pirate fest. That was cool. So that was 2001. And Jen, it was two, yeah, it was yeah. So it would have been 2001. Did you, did you go to AAA at all? No. Well, I did. I ended up remember because I got called. I made the team at a spring. Yeah, and and, uh, and then got dominated. I mean, I like oh, really. Oh, it was that first. What did you week, learn from that? That big leagues is hard. Huh. <laughs> They're really good. I had a good, I had a good These spring. guys could play. I had a good enough spring to make the team. You know, I played good defensively. I got, you know, I, I, I think he hit like 270, 280. It was a good spring. But I, I mean, I had my, I had my place set up in Nashville. I thought I was going there. Oh. Our car was set up to go there. Julie had set up our apartment, the whole nine yards. So I made the team. They told me on like the last day, and I'm like. I'm going to Cincinnati and I'm like so we can cancel all the Nashville stuff and I'm like honey we're going to Cincinnati so I thought the whole time I was going there because I hadn't gone to AAA yet and then just got feasted on like punchy punchy punch like air here air there how long I was there for a month and it was the hardest thing I'd ever gone through in the paper like should Wilson is Wilson ready to be here like type of stuff and just dealing with that sure. yeah. for the first time being on TV making airs on TV and you were carrying that weight I, yeah and honestly I didn't carry that weight in a sense just because like I was always like alright what are you going to do about it like that hey, was man. always my thing like, like you can either complain you can pound or you can do something about it and get back to work so I would go out to early work and what why is good dad yeah, I know yeah, yeah, right? so true so I would go out to early work I'd go out to early hitting and i just try to figure it out and honestly I just wasn't ready I just wasn't ready for that and um, that's not easy to admit but this is cool I go in Van- Cam-, Cam Bonifay calls me into the office we're he's, playing the Giants he's the general manager he's the general manager we're playing for the Giants he's like hey playing against Giants at home I just I just want to bring you in here we believe in you just we're going to give you the day off but we want you to just relax. Just be, you're here because you're you. It's, you're having a tough go, but it's part of the, it's part of it. I think I was hitting 180. It's part of it, but relax. You're, you're not going anywhere. We're going to ride with you. You're our guy. I'm like, cool. Not knowing this at the time, I had been to a car dealership earlier that day and I wanted this used Mustang. So with my first check, I bought, I bought a car for Julie because she Good worked so hard for the minor leagues, uh, working jobs, so that we could live together. So we didn't have Amen. to have roommates. 
that was our we were married and oh. we were not gonna have roommates so she had to take jobs at Chili's at a bank Son at a kindergarten God. kinder care player so, the that best, we, aren't they? so we could make enough money to, to live on our own so my first check I took her and said hey this is our first check in store just get what you want we got a little SUV a little Ford Explorer it was awesome then the second check comes because it's like towards the end of the month and I'm like they had this red used like 1990 something Mustang. Like, like five thousand dollars. Was like a candy and apple like, red too. Like just I love this. Ca- I've always wanted this car. I'm like I love Mustangs, and I'm like I can't pull the trigger right because I don't know. I think I'm gonna send down. Yeah. So, so he tells me all that stuff. He, Bon-, he, bon- so you just relax. I literally go back and get my cell phone. <laughs> say, the go get the car. Get get the the go get, don't come to the game. I'm not playing. Go get the car. Right. <laughs> got the day off. Perfect timing. <laughs> it gets better. No. This is the best. Yeah. So we play the game. She gets the car. She brings it right to the stadium. She brings it. I stadium. get called into the office after the game and get sent down here. No. <laughs> to hey, the car home. No. Uh, this is the best. So I get. They literally change their minds. And I'm, uh, and I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> Crap! It, it went three I just, hours. I just literally wrote a check for five grand for this Mustang. I bought it out, so I'm like, "Are you? Oh, whoops!" Me? So <laughs> whoops. I, I go, whoops. I go to Julie. I'm like, "So we're going to Nashville." <laughs> but here's where it gets so. I'm like, I got this car, and I'm like, I have all these emotions, right? So half of it is like, "Dang, that sucked," but the other half is like. I'm excited to get back to work, yeah. and now it's going to be a lot easier. I'm not Different on TV. Yeah, I'm not on the big. I'm not fighting against Bigly pitching. Yeah, yeah. So I get back to. The, I'm driving back uh, with Julie to the to our apartment. In your new ride. In the new ride. Oh She's got her car. I said, "Honey, here's what we're going to do. Right now, I need you to call your mom. I need her to fly out here. I need you to pack up this place. I'm going to drive to Nashville tonight. I got to go." I, I literally have to get back to work. I can't handle this. So Amen. I, I oh, got awesome. I got sent down, and within three hours, I was on the road driving to Nashville, Tennessee, by myself, just completely just l- just praying and just getting on the road and just following the light lines until I got tired. Pull off at a truck stop, fall asleep, get back on the road. Marty Brown, Marguerite Brown is in Nashville. He is the he's the head coach at uh, the manager in Nashville. I had him in Altoona. And I literally walk in the office just like, just, and I'm like, hey, Skip, I'm ready to go. And he's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> yes. And he's like, you yes. have three days to be here. You're supposed to be here in three days. I'm like, bro, what do you want me to do? Catch a pirate game? I, I need to get back to work. I'm like, can I play tonight? He said, absolutely not. You're not even on our roster. I'm like, can I take our balls? Can I hit BP? He's like, yes. I'm like, can I pinch hit? He goes, no, you're not on the roster. I said, can you get me on the roster tomorrow? He said, yes. I said, good. Went and checked in the hotel, came back for early work, hit BP, and then the next day I was on the roster. And, and that's back. why I love him. And that's why I couldn't, well, I love I couldn't handle it. Because I mean, that's the only way you do it. Because I, could, there was not, three I, days? Couldn't, I couldn't fix it, what I was going through. Yep. And honestly, the first week, struggled to find the swing again, but I started getting better defensively. And then I was like, by the end of the month, I was, I was hitting 370 and team was winning and I was killing it. I and mean, I was having fun play baseball again. Yeah. And that was my key is enjoying it so much. So I don't think I've ever told you this so much. So I get the call from Marty Brown said, Hey, we got to get you on a flight. You're going to join up with the team in Detroit. And I asked, and I said to him, word for word, do I have to go? And he said, what? I said, do I have to go? He's like, I don't think I've ever called a guy up to the big leagues. Gave him the call and asked him. I was like, bro, I go up there. I'm hitting 180. I'm probably have a 94 fielding percentage. And I'm also getting a little bit of razz in the clubhouse, which is part of it. You know, the the, the hazing back in the day yeah. was part of it. You I didn't got, mind you got that. In a different way, though. I didn't mind that. It was it was tough, but it's also yeah. part. Of, it was part of the game at the time. So I dealt with it. It was fine. But I go up there, I'm like, I feel like it's gonna, I'm not gonna enjoy it as much. He's like, Jack, whatever you're doing right now, whatever happened in the past, just go be you, go do exactly it, change absolutely nothing, don't look at the scoreboard, just go play. I'm like, all right, fine, I'll go to the Piglies. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> but that was me, I loved, I loved the game, I loved wow. having fun, and I was having a blast down there, I was doing well. And I'm like, I go back up there, and I just feel like I felt like that month would be repli- would be replicated. 
you know, and that feeling I had with just not being good enough. But then I just kind of, once he said that, I just like, all right, just have an open mind and just keep going playing. And then never, yeah, other than rehab assignments, never came back down. It was okay, awesome. Okay, so you go to Detroit then. Yeah. And you play against the Tigers. Do yeah. you remember anything about that? I hit my first home run uh, that the series. second day against, yeah, Steve Sparks' knuckleballer. Your first home, home run of a knuckleballer. Yeah, well, at Detroit. Pitcher's ballpark too. That's Pitcher, how you yeah. yeah, that's right. But I, 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 I think I think was really cool is Todd Ritchie. Yeah. Came up to me right in the right came right up to me and he's like, I'm so happy you're here. And I was like, dude, I was I had eight errors behind you guys. Probably made a couple behind him, but he was just like he was excited for me to be back. And he felt I think he believed in me and what I could do defensively. And I was like, for our for our ace at the time, our pitcher. You know, we had like Jimmy Anderson, but he was like, I think he was our ace. I think he might have been our opening well, he day was starter. the opening day starter. I was just going to yeah. say. So for him to say like, that. Yeah, you had just basically met him out of spring yeah. training. And yeah. Because I'm back and I'm thinking, okay, like some of these older guys are giving, they give me a pretty, pretty tough time. But they were cool. They were like, hey, welcome back. Because I felt like they followed, they followed, they kind of saw what was yeah. going on and how I was doing. But that, that was special to me that Todd Ritchie said that to me. Because then I, then I went out and I, the rest of the year played really good defense and, and just started to figure out the offensive stuff a little bit and and uh and then yeah that was that was it did that home run really relax you too was that a big deal did no you a home run hit? Todd I honestly, Richie relaxed you yeah Todd yeah. it was it was that pretty, it was really Richie's it was comments and it was it's something, something to be said when a guy that has time yeah. comes up and believes yeah. in you especially at a shortstop just to say or that. a catching just, position where like yeah that defense is so important and when, when he says yeah, because I remember when I came to the Pirates, I had Paul Mahalem's sheet, and he said, let's go win us a baseball game, me and you today. Yeah. Everything went like, okay, yeah. all right, let's go, go win a baseball game. Then we won like seven in a row. And it was like that. those moments yeah. mean more than you could ever imagine because, yeah, do I belong? Yeah, they traded for me, but I'm the eighth guy. Right, and right. for him, like he had that experience. I made the open day rush. You only do that once. And you struggle, and then you go down and ball out. I, I, yeah. I, I get it. Like that's that is a, a pure moment because you've seen the other side, and that's so cool. Because yeah. that he probably has no clue how much that no. meant to you. He might not and even how remember, it kind yeah. of elevated you to another level. He probably doesn't remember. He, he probably even said it, but it made a huge impact so on, cool. on the feeling I had, the nervousness getting back to that level again. And dude, like Detroit back in the day, like you had Weaver. Yeah. Dude, I'm like, gosh, dang, it's back to this. But it was just like. I'm just going to keep that same positivity I had, that same, just be like, I can, I belong here. I can do this. Like, I'm going to go through some lumps. And, and, you know, I had Dave Clark was our hitting coach, and he helped out a lot with understanding, like, it's going to be a grind. It's going to be difficult. But you just got to come every day and just be willing to learn and be willing to just understand that it's part of the job. It's, but come out here and just catch the dang ball. <laughs> just catch the yeah, ball, yeah. and we'll worry about hitting. But just catch the ball. I'm like, all right, I think mm. I, can, I can do that. Well, Jack, now out of spring training in 2001, you said you were – Surprise! Because obviously you were, because you guys were set up in Nashville. But do you remember that moment at all? It was Lloyd McClendon. Yeah. Does he tell you at some point, the very end, hey, you're on the club? How does that work? And what was your feeling when you were told that? I think he thought he was the one that told me, but it was Pat Mears that actually told me. Oh. So we oh, played late. Yeah. So we're playing. I think we have two games left, uh, and we're playing. We're we're we're, stre we're stretching before the second to last game, and it's kind of shifted to where I was backing up Pat Mears at short and then they were experimenting with moving Pat Mears a second and then for the last week and a half two weeks we were starting games together and me not knowing anything about how spring training goes I'm just like just, I'm just trying to yes, just, just yeah. trying to take it all in because yeah. I still think at this point I'm just trying to get ready for my AAA season <laughs> so I'm this not even paying this attention your first, this is your first big league camp first big league camp oh, man. I'm not even looking between the lines like why is Pat Mears a shortstop for his whole career playing second I didn't even register that. that way I didn't even think that, that, that way that is no, how it consumed you yeah, 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 yeah. no so one mean. even told me I'm like oh dude I'm starting today and like Pat Mears playing second for like the third day in a row I didn't even think about it wow. and then how so, naive we can be right oh my gosh, it's so it's good incredible. So, yeah. so Pat was also really cool about like he was probably not happy he had signed a four year sure, deal yeah. and he's having to slide over for this young kid and yeah. and he, I never got that feeling from him the entire time huh. I played for him like he was upset about moving or anything like that he was always so gracious with me him and Mike Benjamin helped me out so much with taking me in and talking about like being a shortstop and understanding like to teach me the nuances of the position at that level and i never got that from him and i always i thought he was one of my favorite one of my favorite teammates even though we only got one year together because 
He was always that guy to put his hand around my shoulder when I was when it wasn't Mears. going well. It's was Pat Mears. Yeah, isn't that yeah. funny? Because the perception. Yeah. Uh, I, I like Pat Mears. Some people, you know, he had, I think he wanted to win and be so good right. that he focused on that and, and maybe rubbed people outside the clubhouse right. the wrong way. But Everything I, I, changes I, inside that clubhouse. Of course. Well, it's also, too, yeah. Yeah, people, when you sign a contract and it ends up not working oh, yeah. out, we think it like we think so badly of the player, but he's still right. a human being. No doubt. And it's like, you know, it's not like we're trying not to do In well. In fact, the opposite <laughs> is yeah. true. And yeah. you remember, he had that accident, yes, too. Yes, he had the handmade Where he is Three trying things. to play, he's wrapping up his bat because yeah. he can't grip with his pinky because right. he's got this injury. And you're like, but hugely impactful on the, on the beginning of my career, and, and trying to help me navigate both on and off the field because Joe Joe Bimel and I were the only rookies. So hey, pitcher, pitchers had Joe Bimel, and then I had guys like Pat. Mears Joe Bimel had me as a rookie. I'll yeah. never forget it. Yeah, and yeah. Pat never gave me any hazes. Like he was not far like one of those guys. He was trying to help. Kevin Young was enormous for me. Just just giving me encouragement because I was the only position player in that dugout so like I was the guy you're going to pick on and thank goodness for the Bose noise canceling headphones that came out that yeah. year on Those the bus because bus yep. I needed that to just be like alright they're going to wear me out right and, now and, 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 I, and it's okay I yeah. think I've told but you I'm going to click these bad boys off yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, told, I've told you that before yeah. I mean, yeah. we, they, they wore him, wore him out, out. Yeah. It was, uh, I've heard and, a lot of the stories and he, yeah. And, yeah. But, but you know uh, we won't get into philosophy about society in this day and age and no hazing and stuff like yeah. that Jack and Michael because I remember when that was taken away essentially yeah. I remember where we were when when the hazing happened and I don't know if you were at the club then but it was basically taken away there would be no more of that and but that's what makes you who you are that yeah. molds you you were you, you were tougher because yeah. of it. you got thick skin well, i honestly feel i understood that that's what they had to do when they were rookies. Yeah, right yeah so yeah. i understood the problem i didn't down. i didn't take it personal right even though some stuff i think went over the line i was still living a dream i was still playing major league baseball and if this was part of it it was part of yeah. it it lasted long it lasted two years which i thought was like come a little, on, little much but it was cool yeah, like yeah, hey yeah. you love this yeah. so <laughs> we talked and we've talked about how you make the adjustment you either you do either accept it or you do something about it yeah, yeah. so second year just a couple of guys still stealing my clothes and trying to get me to I dress love the story. up yeah yeah and i'm like all right i did it for one year back in the day too we would walk through the airports before 9-11 where now we're going right we would have, you know, we, no I'm sorry we were going on the tarmac so then 9-11 hit and then that year or the rest of the year that's and right. the next year we had to walk through right. the airports before they started putting yeah. the screenings at the stadiums right. so we're walking through the airports so it's perfect time to just dress up guys all the time and I'm dressed up all the time and I'm like Ugh, this is year two and I'm like I'm just going to take it and I'm like no it's not happening anymore yeah. so I would show up if we're playing on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'd show up early Friday before anybody can get there, and I would hide a suit in the clubhouse what somewhere. What a great move. So then when they would take my suit, oh. sometimes they would, sometimes they wouldn't. But if they would take my suit, I would have my secondary suit. What a so great this time move. we're in Cincinnati. And Mike Williams, I, was, I don't uh, I know. <laughs> hey, Mikey was an all-star closer for us. Yeah. Good dude. I understood yeah. what the process was. I don't take it personally. Yeah. But I got to the point, I'm like, all right, I'm going to start doing this. Sometimes I didn't need it. I would just go get it and put it right back in my carry-on. But this one time, they did it. And that was like a Hooters outfit. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> so, I, so, I, so I get done showering, and, there was like, and it's hung up in my locker. And I'm like, I put my underwear and my socks on, walk back to this back room, come out. I walk by Mike Williams like, yeah, you guys are going to have to do better than this. Oh, and just fix the tie, so walk right nice. by him. And they just looked at me, and they didn't do it ever again. That was it. They stopped. You got that. So I'm like, dude, you guys gonna have yeah. to up your game. Man, that's so good. You're gonna have to up Such your game. Such a great and story. Part, part of I so think what, what they want. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, right, like, right. All right. right. You he get, gets it. He that's how you get yeah. back. But yeah, yeah, sometimes it goes way too far. I mean, I was a baby. Yeah. On yeah. one of the trips, I dressed up like a baby. Oh, yeah, literally, yeah. Oil you're up. a baby. Yes. Was a Did you act baby. like a baby too? <laughs> I had a diaper yeah, on with a big, I had it all, <laughs> and I had to serve everybody on the plane oh my the entire gosh. time. And it yes. wasn't like just Colorado. Uh, we went East Coast, oh. so you know it's a two and a half hour <laughs> flight. And I'm serving, but before we even left, they they held back the flight. And we had to go serve at a local bar beforehand. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it's one of those things like. 
and then I had to get off the bus and walk a mile to the hotel. That's what it was. Oh. In New York, we would we would have to get they drop you off and like we'll see you at the hotel. And then make you take your suitcase. Man. I'm in a diaper. Oh yes. my god. Yes. yes. The good thing about New York, it wasn't too awkward because yeah. everybody was kind of dressed yeah. weird anyway. Like, uh, yeah. It didn't stand out actually. Yeah. yeah. People ever look yeah. looking at you. I was in either St. Louis or Milwaukee. I don't remember, but yeah. So I, I stood out a little. Yeah. It was wow. part but there was of a it. Bunch of, there was like six of us. It was part of yeah. it. It was part of it. You understood it. Yeah. You know. Do you remember, uh, Jack, your your first, you mentioned Todd Ritchie did start that game in Cincinnati. Your first big league at bat was against uh, Osvaldo Fernandez, yeah. I believe. I think you struck out your first time, but then you got a double. Yeah. Uh, Second at bat. Second at bat. What's the wind that comes like into your right. cells after that? Yes. It, was, it wasn't. It was coasting into second and having Barry Larkin come say congratulations. Oh, oh Barry Larkin. Come on. Yeah, that's so true. I, uh, what hit? You're like, I hit. What just happened? Mr. Barry Larkin? Yes. 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 No way. Which was even cooler because four years later, I get my 200 hit of the season at Cincinnati. And who comes over? Barry Larkin. Come on. Wow. You can't You can't make it up. Who? Stop Barry Larkin fight. that year that year Barry Larkin makes the All-Star game he's going to retire Barry Larkin makes the All-Star game he goes up to Jack McKeon who won the World Series with Florida the year before he says Marley. I do not want to play a defensive inning because Jack belongs on the field because Edgar Renneria won the fan vote and you had Barry Larkin he's like give me in at bat but Jack because I was hitting 330 Edgar Renneria was hitting 270 I was I think top 5 in the National League in batting average and he went to Jack McKean and said, hey, I'm happy to be, because he was hitting 290 that year. He was doing great. He's like, I want the at-bat, but I want Jack to play the game. He deserves to be out here. So I got two at-bats because Barry Larkin told the manager to put me in instead of him. That's why baseball is amazing. And he's the guy that shook my hand on my 200 hit at the end of that year. Remember, we, we closed 2004 in Cincinnati. I need one hit going into that series. I need one hit for 200. And I got that hit. I shot a shooter to right. The last fly of all out, last out, I got to second base, and there's a picture, you can look it up. If you look up Barry Larkin and Jack Wilson, and it's him reaching out his hand, congratulating me for my 200th hit. He's the same guy who created And, and, oh, no. and his he's last at bat, and Barry Larkin. So this is all Barry Larkin. Barry Larkin's last at bat, his last at bat since he that year, I dove up the middle, and we turned a glove flip double play on him in his very last at bat. Come off it! Come on. No! Oh my gosh, Dave. Have you seen him since? No, I don't think I he's have. A, he's, a, he's a color analyst for the Reds. I, don't I can't wait I to have. tell him. But I remember diving from the ball. I'm like, I should totally let this go. Because it's, it, he was uh, only going to have one at bat. It was the first at bat of the game. And I remember diving and hoping that it would bounce. There it is. Well, there so it's it. so, it'll be, he's I'll like holding it. out his hand. Oh and I remember like, he's only going to have one at bat. And then he's going to like address the entire stadium in like the fifth inning or whatever. And I remember reaching out, hoping that it would bounce over my glove. And then it went in my glove. I'm like, sorry, Barry. I, I <laughs> it's everything oh everything slowed down blood. for a minute, right? And it was also wow. it set the record for most double plays turned by a shortstop <laughs> in Pirates history. I'm telling you, like, it all, oh it's all very lucky. Love it's, this game sometimes. So I, yeah, wow. so I'm like, gosh, that dang it. Unbelievable. So when he's addressing the team, he's addressing the stadium, talking about like, the, he, goes he goes up to the press box like the Pope. With, I've with never the seen mic. like it. With a microphone. Like where the press That's box the way it is, should be, right? Because he's Final a legend. Plate. He goes, he starts talking to everybody. Looks down. I'm on deck. This is between innings. He's like, he's like, I wanted one last at bat for you guys to get down. But he's like, but Jack took my hit. That's <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> he called me out. I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you do that? I, I did. I, oh, I'm like, dude, because I'm listening the whole time. This is Barry Larkin. And I'm like, we've had these little, these little yeah, yeah, like moments. moments that were hugely influential for me. Like. The best, one of the top best shortstops of all time, maybe top ten shortstop of all time, and Barry Larkin on how amazing he was. And it was funny because Kurt Stewell got traded because Barry Larkin came through the Cincinnati. So, so Kurt Stewell had to get traded because Barry Larkin came in. It's wow. like all like all intertwined. Wow, it's crazy. It's crazy. But yeah, yeah, I have that picture in my house. That, that picture of him reaching out. I did not know. That. Yeah. I can't wait to tell Larkin that story. Dude. Wow, that's hysterical. I have I only oh, have a couple of jerseys signed, wow. and he's one of them. And he wrote this huge long message. Like I'm like, and that's what Barry Larkin, the most, right? Yeah, Barry, man, wow. love, oh, man, love that guy. So good. Wow. That, so you you got the you actually got 201 hits that year. Yeah, yeah. I ended up hitting again. hit the next day after that night. Yeah, and that's incredible. Uh, that, 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 I didn't realize it. Looked it up before this, this episode that it was the first pirate to collect 200 hits since Dave Parker in 1977. Wow. 
It's unbelievable. And there were only like nine uh, National League shortstop. He was the ninth National League shortstop in history oh. to collect 200 hits in a season. That was a cool year. Cause, yeah, and Jack, because you're known, when you came to the Pirates, we all know Pirates just got a great defensive shortstop before you even made it to the big leagues. That was the word. And when you first got to the big leagues, and then you have this incredible year, and you really have... It's almost like your defense overshadowed your offense. You were a solid offensive player too. It was it was funny, and I I, I tell these I talk to kids a lot about adjusting your game for different reasons, different things, and understanding when you look in the mirror, what do I need to get better at? My entire minor league career was was offensive. So I opened up, and John Cena hit 370 and, and won a batting title. Huh. The next year in A ball, I hit 340. I was the guy that got two hits every game. Huh. If I didn't get two hits, I'm in the cage because if, if I went one for four, there's oh. a problem. Oh. I had a, I, Julie and I, we had a blanket that in, in our apartment that I hung up, and if I didn't get two hits, she's soft tossing me in our living room oh, in A ball. Gosh. Like, I, I could not handle not getting two hits. So I was. So you're kind of hard on yourself. A little bit, just a little bit. But I was. But that was my forte. I was yeah. not a good defender. Wow, I made thirty something errors in air ball, a ball. I was athletic, but the routine play was terrible for me. But if you hit it to my right and my left, I can get my feet. Oh and I can make gosh. a cool play. But I was not a good defender until wow. like double A, where it started to kind of click how to control my body in a in a manner that was controlled and but not. You wanted hyper. to be a good. I did. I loved every bit of it. I loved every minute of it. So I get to the big leagues. And I play my first year, 220, but I'm playing decent defense, decent enough. Next year, and the thing is, catch the ball, catch the ball, catch the ball. Don't worry about hitting. So it became okay for me to hit 250 because they're asking me to catch the ball. They're not expecting me to do something, and I buy into this. One of my worst mistakes I think I've ever made. I bought into understanding that I'm here to catch the ball and the defensive is secondary because that's kind of what they're asking me to do in not so many words. So sure enough, 2003 comes around. I got to go to arbitration, which is one of the worst experiences ever. It's just a tough situation for both parties. I they got to argue against you. Yeah. You got to argue against them. You're and then you're supposed to, to shake hands and hug afterwards. Like, well, you, don't, you, don't have, to just have, so you don't have to be there, do you? You do. You have yeah. to be you yes, have to sit there. That. You have to sit there yeah. and, and endure and three it. and a half hours. You should have brought the headphones with you. Yeah, I you know. Had you should have had those, those headphones. Yeah. I didn't but know I left through our Yeah, it was tough. It was really tough. You got to go play for that team. Their job is to tell you how bad you are. And I was told in that in that arena, you got... All their people, MLB plus Pirates, your people, your agents, and then your panel here. And I was, you are the worst shortstop in Major League Baseball. That's hard. Dang. Wow, I thought That's it was pretty hard. decent. Yeah. But I understood the business side of it. Yeah. I was prepared Ooh. by my agent that it's business. Oh. It's not personal, but it, you do kind of feel like, why am I playing for you? Like, why? Yeah. yeah. I'm so bad. Yeah. But I got, I, I understood. Yeah. I understood it. Uh, but then I was like, all right. Let's just spend the entire offseason just banging, just swinging. Because I spend my – if I, you're going to ask me to catch the ball, I need to be a great defender. I'm going to take a bazillion ground balls, and I'm going to be a great defender. I'm going to do something about that. So, all right. Then I went the offseason, and I'm like, all right, you want me to swing it? Let's go. And I went back to that same thought process. I am not not getting two hits today. So I go 0 for 1 against Kevin Millwood, opening day against the Philadelphia Phillies in 2004. I go 0 for 1. I hit a base hit up the middle. In probably third or fourth inning, I'm hitting eighth. That was the last, that 0 for 1, that first at bat was the one and only time in the entire season that I did not hit 300. I went 1 for 2 when my batting in I went 1 for 3 that day, but that 1 for 2, that 0 for 1, was the only time the rest of the season that I did not have a 300 batting. You were on a mission. I went the entire time. The, year, the, the very year you went into arbitration, you did that. They came back the next spring training and said, all right, fine. Because their message was, hey, you can keep on picking it, but if you don't swing it a little bit, Holy cow. your your trajectory and your career look a little different. So it was just basically con con just changing my entire thought process on offense. I mean, like, fine. So I hit more than I, but I also had my worst defensive year that year. Oh, I did not, and I hated it, right? that. I hated yeah. that. I yeah. hated not making the. I made. I mean, I was. I think I had 17 errors, but before I think the most I ever made was like 14 or 15. That bothered me. That bothered me then, so but I so I had to find that that median where I could try to keep keep this, the hitting part of it, and then by also by also stay on the fielding. But then the worst thing happened. The worst possible thing that could happen is I go into that off season now two you know two three oh eight two hundred hits, unbelievable. And I said 
I'm going to do this every year. I'm working twice as hard as I did the year before. Twice as hard as I did going into 2004. This is going to happen every year, and I'm going to make sure it does. And I am rock solid. I am strong. I'm doing Pilates, so my core is strong, and I'm killing it. Sure enough, December 21st, appendicitis. I get misdiagnosed. Oh, no. They don't catch it. Next thing you know, they put me in the machine. So appendicitis, you have this. You feel like there's a knife in your stomach. It's the most painful thing I've ever endured. And then all of a sudden, the pain goes away, which basically means your appendix bursts. You now have poison throughout your yeah, entire yeah. stomach. They find this out. I'm in the emergency room. I go eight hours before I see a doctor. Oh, no. This day, now I feel fine. The like pain's gone. But they're like, hey, we're going to put you through this machine. They do the machine. And then I got three surgeons coming in in blues going, we need to get you on the surgeon table right now. And they got to cut open all of, like, they got to cut me open to get all the suck Yeah, the they got to clean out. it all out. Yeah. Oh. Every Pilates thing, every muscle I had, because I can't walk for seven to eight days. I can't walk. I can't work. I can ride a bike by mid-January. I got spring training happening mid-February. Everything I did the entire off season was gone. I show up to spring training at 177. Holy! I was loving. I was 95, just ready to go for another All Star year. I'm. This is going to happen, and I am. I hit the ball. It goes nowhere. I am exhausted all the time. I go through spring training just trying to gain weight, and I. I am fast as all get out, though. I can move. Oh, you're my range is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. But I am a rail. And wow. I'm like, and so I went through all of 2005 just trying to fight, trying to get strength. You're fighting every day to I'm get like, through. Yeah, that's that's and, that's tough. And I like Man. they're they're making they're writing all these articles about it and stuff. Like, oh, it was a one year wonder. And I'm like, that's dude, they I'm have just, no clue, do they? I'm, I'm yeah. just trying. Like, then I go that year. I think I hit like 257, and you're like, oh, that's it. It was one year deal. I'm like, man. I tried. I, I tried everything I could. And then I was like, man, it just, it's just the way it worked out that year. It was so tough to go through because I didn't want to be known at that. I wanted that to keep happening. That's why I was working so hard. Yeah. I didn't want to sit on it and be like, oh, I got it made. Now I hit 300. I wanted to keep doing that because I knew that was going to help us win games. If I can pick it and, and hit. And then that one year, I'm like, gosh, dang it. Like, that was the worst. Because I, I had that thought process. I'm like, I'm going to do this every year. And I was gung ho. And I was like, man, I lost everything I worked for for three three months was out the window, just like that. I'm like, man. Well, then the next couple of years, you, you rebound. Two seventies, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was, it was, it was good, and I and I I liked it, and I just like that one year, I was just so upset because I felt like, I felt like I did the right thing because I, you sometimes you see in this game somebody has success and then they sit on it, they come back the next year, and yeah. it's just like. Oh, you obviously didn't continue to work, and I'm like, that is not happening. If anybody me. knows anything about you, we know you did the right thing. Yeah, it's just yeah, that I'm like, that it's easier not... thing to write about and talk about. Yeah, is he's the same old guys everybody. Else. And I, I made the mistake of being truthful with a reporter uh, and be like, dude, the the you know the appendix that really set me back, and I, that's all I said, not knowing that the entire thing was written. Be like, oh, we're just making excuses, oh, like, oh, and I just oh, got oh. blown up, and that changed my thing about press from then on out. Oh, really? I never talked to that reporter again. Really? Because I felt like it was a trap situation. I felt like wow. he wanted me to make an excuse oh, my when I was God. just having a conversation. I'm like, just, I'm just battling Incredible. what happened in December. It's a, it's a continuous battle to get strength back. That's the stuff for me. Yeah. From the press box, it is trying to under, re- realize that there are things going on physically for you guys yeah. that yeah. we're not aware of yeah. and you don't want to make excuses yeah. that's why I love guys that play every day yeah. I, yeah. I think that's just so cool yeah. Yeah. I love you know the story that we talked about him we, we could see he destroyed his knee that one game right right and and, and uh, to, he's done and he comes back and he goes out and catches like three or four more innings like, well, how's he doing that but he didn't want to come out of the game. Didn't want to come I out didn't. Of the game. It, was, it was part of it. And same yeah. same thing with Jack. When I was a pirate in 2011, I came in and in the first game I threw out a guy. Next game I threw out a guy, and I had a slap tear in my labor room that year. And I didn't realize I was I was told to take a little time off. When I took that time off, I couldn't raise my arm up. So come back 2012, I can't throw the way I could. And I didn't realize, but I didn't know how to. I didn't know my feet I didn't know my hands I didn't know what I just always was naturally gifted to throw the ball where I wanted it and I never told anybody until I got to play I think the only person knew was my wife my trainer and maybe Banny and Banny spent every day in 2013 out early every day I threw the bases I got Banny this is what I have to throw he goes let's go 
every day we went out and threw. I think I did that year maybe right at 20%, but in the minor leagues, I never threw under 35 or 40. So it was weird for me. And you're right, like, I was getting destroyed, and I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to handle it. Luckily, I had Rod, too, and he... He was at the probably the end of his career, and he said, "Man, Barajas, yeah. Barajas, Barajas, <laughs> So yeah, like we all go through that, and I think sometimes trying to be the team guy can hurt you. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, like yeah, balance. he's fighting, and the wear and tear you took that year, nobody will ever understand. No. And because like that fight to get back into weight and do those things is so hard. And when you're tired every day, you're doing it. In fact, you get 250, it's amazing. No. Well, make sure you like and subscribe this Jack Wilson episode. There's more. There's so much more that you'll hear on another episode. We talk about his relationship with Freddie Sanchez, the trade to Seattle, his career, 9-11, PNC Park. Baseball is all about the stories. Jack Wilson has so much more to tell you on Hold My Cutter.